Okay, uh, good morning everyone. I hope that you're ready to get into the portion of our time together uh, where we study God's Word. And we're going to be talking all about Acts chapter 2 this morning. Just one of the most significant chapters in the Bible. One of the most significant uh, chapters in history, uh, really. And we'll talk all about why that is the case um, after we go to God in prayer. Father in heaven, we praise your name. Thank you so much for your son who is willing to suffer and to go outside the the gates, um, give himself as a sin offering on our behalf, and then invite us to dine with him. So grateful for the supper that we just shared and for the future uh, glory that we'll get to share uh, with you where we can um, be invited to that heavenly supper forever in your presence. We're just so grateful for that. We hope for it. We long for it. We love you. We're so grateful for your word. Help it to change us to transform us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, so I will say at the start of class, uh, if you want to text in uh, any comments or questions at all. Uh, okay, so I hit the advance button and it went blank. Hang on one second. Huh. Okay. All right, it's back. Let's see. Is there... I've never seen that happen before. <clears throat> All right, well, we'll, I don't know what's going on with the PowerPoint. Uh, hopefully we'll figure that out. Um, if you have questions or comments, okay, here we go. It's up now. <laughs> if we can bring it to the, hey, there we go. All right, great, great, really appreciate. Man, our troubleshooting is just so, so awesome back there. Uh, Y'all are just so great about figuring that stuff out. So grateful for all your good work. Okay, so let me say what I was trying to say uh, again, that if you're at home watching in, you want to text in your answer, uh, feel free to do that at any time. You don't necessarily have to wait for me to say, hey, you know, are there any comments or questions? You can actually text those in as we go. Um, I do want to say, if you text something in that I disagree with, I will handle it differently than I did last week. Um, I will read your text, and then I will engage it from there. There, were, there was a very specific reason I did that last week. Uh, it made perfect sense to me in my head, but it just didn't come across very good. It kind of, I don't know, made it look like I was some sort of dictator and silencing dissenting voices. If you disagree, I will not read your, your comment. Well, no, 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 that, that wasn't my intention at all. And, you know, it may have made the person who texted in, you know, made people wonder about that person. You know, oh, wow, were they saying something really, really heretical? Uh, that, that just wasn't the case uh, at all. And I've already, you know, gone and made things right with, with that person over this. So going to handle it differently. If you text in, don't be afraid. I say that to say, I just don't want you to be afraid. Like, oh man, if I, if I text in an answer, Brian's just going to, you know, shut it down. Don't worry about that. Chime in. Please be involved even though you're at home. Um, Acts 2, again, one of the most significant events in history. It is the inauguration of God's spiritual kingdom on earth. It's the day when God first creates 3,000 people in the new humanity who will now be His temple, His spiritual temple with His presence dwelling among them and where they'll live the way they were originally designed to live according to God's will. Um, and... It's easy to remember the Old Testament prophecies about Acts 2 because the chapters match. What three other chapter 2s from the Old Testament foresee this moment in history? Do you know? Okay, Daniel 2. That's one of them. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream of this huge statue, and it has four parts represented by four kingdoms. And that fourth kingdom is Rome, and he sees that there's a stone that comes out of nowhere and just destroys the statue. And then the stone becomes a mountain that fills the whole earth. That's what's happening in Acts 2. Jesus, his kingdom is entering in, crushing all the other kingdoms, and then his kingdom that starts out small, like this stone, will then spread throughout the whole earth. The, the mountain will fill the entire world. Um, any other twos you could think of? Isaiah? Yes, Isaiah too. Very good. So he also picks up on the mountain imagery and he says that the mountain of the Lord will be raised up above all the other mountains. It will be the chief mountain. And on top of the mountain of the Lord will sit the Lord's house, the temple. And all the nations, all the Gentiles will stream to this mountain, to the temple of the Lord, to learn about God's word. And there will be great peace uh, among the nations and among the Gentiles. And the last two is actually mentioned by Peter in Acts 2, and that's Joel 2. 
Because Joel says this is the time when he will pour out his spirit on all mankind. Here's the catch, though. If, if God is going to inaugurate his kingdom, it has to be crystal clear in people's minds who's king. And that's what the major part of Acts 2 will be about. Proving by miracles, proving by evidence of the resurrection, and proving by Old Testament scriptures themselves that Jesus of Nazareth is king. And here's the takeaway. King Jesus gathers and restores God's scattered people. Remember earlier in Acts 1, 6, they asked him about, you know, when is Israel going to be restored? Because Israel was really, they were scattered all over the world at the time. After the Babylonian exile, they were in they, not all of them came back to the land. Some of them just stayed where they were. And does anybody remember the, the technical term for what that was called? The, the Jews that were scattered all over the world? Diaspora. Yeah, the diaspora, the, the dispersion. Okay, I think diaspora is Greek uh, for, for dispersion. And it's really important to understand that this wasn't just about geography. It wasn't just, well, they're in a different location. It's that when Alexander the Great came, he made it his effort to Hellenize the world and to get the entire world to adopt Greek culture. And there was a lot of pressure among the Jews, and there was debate among the Jews. How much of Greek culture can we really adopt without compromising our faith in, in Yahweh? And there was division over this. So over time, it came to be that the Jews that stayed in Jerusalem and in the, in the promised land of Canaan, they kind of viewed themselves as morally superior to the Jews of the dispersion because they, they viewed those Jews as compromising their morality. And many of them did, by the way. Many of them did adopt very sinful practices of the Greeks. And so you had all this tension. And where are we going to see later in Acts the tension between the native Hebrews and the dispersion, the Jews of the dispersion? Remember Acts 6. Acts 6. This is going to be a, a problem. Uh, because the, the native Hebrews will be overlooking the Greek Jews in, in the serving that goes on there. Uh, interestingly, when Jesus told people in Jerusalem he was going to be res resurrected and ascend to the Father, here was their response. The Jews then said to one another, where does this man intend to go? That we will not find him. He's not intending to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks, is he? I want you to see there, there's kind of a hint of disbelief and, and a hint of disdain in, this, in their tone here. Is he really going to go to those Greek Hellenistic Jews and teach them? And what's really awesome is after his resurrection and ascension, that's exactly what he does. But he does so by sending the Holy Spirit to the apostles. And the apostles are, are now teaching the Jews of the dispersion. In, in Acts chapter 2 that have been scattered all over. And all throughout the Old Testament, you find this promise where God does say, I will bring my people back to me. And it, it's just all over the Old Testament. But I'll just give you one example. Isaiah 43, do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name and whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed, even whom I have made. And this is exactly what we see start to play out in Acts chapter 2. But did you notice, does this passage seem to be limited to just the Jews? <laughs> Uh, no, because he says, everyone who's called by my name, everyone that I have created for my glory um, will, be, will be gathered to me. And so it's starting with the Jews in Acts 2, but eventually it's going to go to all the, the far ends of the earth. And that's where the book of Acts is headed. And you know, the Jews, they knew all these prophecies about being gathered and restored, but they did not know it would be Jesus who would do this. They did not know it would be Jesus of Nazareth, this, you know, carpenter, right, who would actually be the one to fulfill these promises and bring God's people back. That's what King Jesus is doing. Starts with the outpouring of the Spirit on the apostles. And that's where we're going to pick up in our text in Acts 2. We'll pick up in verse 4. But before I do, any comments, any questions uh, so far on that introduction? Thank <clears throat> you.
All right. Well, let's get into the text of Acts 2, and let's talk about this episode of speaking in tongues. In Acts 2, let's start in verse 4. I know we technically already covered that, but it'll, it'll help set the text up a little bit better. Let's just read through 13, uh, 4 through 13. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit <clears throat> and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered because each of them was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Why are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the districts of Libya around Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them in our own tongues speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And they all continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others were, were mocking and saying, oh, they are full of sweet wine. So let's remind ourselves the context of this is the day of Pentecost. What was the significance of the day of Pentecost? <clears throat> what was that feast for? <laughs> okay, yeah. So it had to do with the harvest. Let me just say, first of all, it's one of the three major Jewish feasts that God required uh, the males, the, you know, the women and children come too, but it was definitely a requirement, at least for the males, to make a trip uh, to Jerusalem. And uh, the word Pentecost means, means 50th uh, because it was 50 days after the Passover. And it was a celebration of the first fruits of the harvest. The Passover was in uh, late March, and they would have already had some crops by then. In fact, they had to offer some of those crops at the Passover feast. But by the time of Pentecost, you know, maybe uh, mid, what is it, the end of April or so, like that's when the, the biggest portion of the first fruits has now come in. And it's called the first fruits because there's still going to be growing crops until sometime in like late October. And what they did was they celebrated this. Uh, there was, it was not only a sign of God's provision, like, hey, he's, he's blessed us with crops right now. The idea of the first fruits is it was a sign of more crops to come. So here's the follow-up question. Why would this feast be fitting for Acts chapter 2 and the establishment of, of God's kingdom? Well, because it would go on and there would be more, more fruit from it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. so There, there would be more fruit from it. And specifically, what kind of fruit? <clears throat> Spiritual fruit, right? Like uh, the harvest of human beings, uh, of souls. Uh, it's a joyous celebratory feast. And that's a perfect time to celebrate not only God's provision of a physical harvest, but God's provision of salvation. And then these 3,000 Jews are going to become the first fruits of God's spiritual harvest. And while that's great to celebrate and rejoice over in the moment, it's also a sign that there will be more to come. And, you know, I don't, I don't want to seem like I'm just making up this analogy. That This is all over the New Testament. Jesus uses language like this, like Luke 10, 2. He was saying to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Um, he talks in John 4 about the, or it might be John. It's in John. I can't remember what chapter, but he says the, the fields are white, you know, for, for harvest. So this concept is all over the place. Even the, the final judgment day is... Uh, described by Jesus as the angels coming back at the final gathering of the harvest. So you see this, this great spiritual provision in Acts chapter 2 and how fitting at the celebration of God's physical provision of first fruits that the church can now celebrate God's spiritual first fruits. So all these Jews of the dispersion have come together. But they have picked up languages from where they're from. And I suppose Peter could have just spoken in like a universal language like Koine Greek or Aramaic. And probably almost everybody would have, would have understood him. But that's not the way God chooses to communicate to these Jews. He empowers the apostles by the Holy Spirit. 
to speak in the mother languages of these various parts of the world, which is just crazy because the apostles are not from there. And they didn't have Rosetta Stone, you know, like we do learn, learn a language. You know, these were Galileans. They were just, you know, simple folk, we would say, uh, by all measures, uh, uneducated. Uh, even Peter and John, you know, the Sanhedrin will look at them and say, you know, these guys are just untrained, uneducated men. How in the world are they, are they speaking like this? Well, because the, the Holy Spirit is empowering them uh, to do that. And uh, people, many of the people are just amazed. They're just astounded at what they're seeing. They want to know what it means. But some of them mock. And I don't know all the logistics here. I would love to have just been there to see exactly how, how all this worked, perhaps because of all the speaking by all the apostles at the same time, uh, some people were confused and you know just wrote them off as, as being drunk. Uh, it could be because uh, there are more regions mentioned here than there were apostles. So it is possible that some of the Jews there weren't actually being addressed. Um, that, that only 12 of the, of the regions were being addressed uh, by the apostles. And so for them, they're not hearing it in their own language. They're hearing all these foreign languages. And they're like, man, what in the world is, is going on here? Again, I'm, just, I'm not 100% sure uh, how, how that worked. But I do think there's kind of an interesting connection here uh, with the idea of the Tower of, of Babel. It, it's almost like a reversal of what happened there. Uh, because back in Genesis 11, when, when mankind was united, well, they were united, but not in a good way. Because they were united around the pride of their own power. And they built this tower. And so God says, you know what, I, I don't want you to unite in that way. So I'm going to scatter you and divide or confuse your languages. And yet here, God actually speaks all of the languages, right, of these scattered people, and yet reunites them under a different power, not their own power, not their own pride, but under the humility of recognizing the power of Jesus. So it's just a really awesome, awesome scene here. King Jesus gathers and restores God's scattered people. Uh, let me ask this question, and then I'll just ask uh, for general questions or comments. How is this different then what we see in people who claim to be modern day tongue speakers, what was different about this? I think now if you see someone like that, there'll be someone who will interpret them or they will interpret it themselves. Okay, yeah. Um, which, yeah, which I guess in this case, they didn't need an interpreter because the, there were people there who actually understood it. But like later in 1 Corinthians 14, when Paul says, look, if you're speaking in a tongue, but there's nobody in the congregation that speaks that language, it's kind of pointless. You're, you're basically just talking to yourself and God at that point. Uh, so only use tongue speaking in the church if you have an interpreter or if you yourself have the power to interpret it for people. Um, yeah, so... So that's a difference. Yeah, Dave? These were known languages. Yeah, these were known languages. These were actual languages of the earth. Many times the claim today by people who speak in tongues is that, well, these are angelic languages. And they get that from, from 1 Corinthians 14 where Paul says, if I speak with the, tongue, the tongues of men or of angels, um, but nobody knows what I'm saying, it, it does me no good. I think Paul's just using hyperbole there. I don't, I don't think his point is, well, you, you're actually going to speak in angelic tongues because what, what in the world is the point of speaking in the angelic language? Well, why do, you, why do you need that? And I've heard explanations and people try to say, well, you just, it draws you closer to God because it's like a spiritual language. And I'm, as I'm praying in those angelic languages, I'm just feeling you know, closer to God. That's just not what we used, you read about. In the New Testament, and and this is the probably the most detailed section on how tongue speaking would would actually work, and it's totally different. They're not just speaking to themselves. It's not an angelic, you know, heavenly language that no humans understand. They're actual real languages of of people in the world. Um, I'm getting some text here. <laughs> yeah, so Jessica Petty, um, modern day tongues is is gibberish. Uh, tongues back then. Uh, was an actual language that, that others could understand. And it, it does. It sounds like gibberish. Um, I've actually seen 
uh, you can actually go on YouTube and, and look up how to speak in tongues. And there will be people who will have tutorials that will actually teach you how to speak in tongues. And I'm just thinking the entire purpose is they don't have to learn how to speak in tongues. The Holy Spirit just does it through them. Like if I have to learn and I have to go through a tutorial, like that's, that's not speaking in tongues the way, the way it was done in, in the first century. Uh, Ryan Park says they were uh, heard each in their own languages um, or, or one voice <coughs> containing uh, many different languages. Yeah, there, again, there's some debate about the exact uh, um, you know, mechanics of, of how all this works, but it, it seems like the, the 12 apostles... You know, each one of the 12 is speaking a, a different language, reaching a, a different group that was there. Yeah, really good. Any other comments or thoughts through verse 13 before we go to the next section? Dave? I just always thought it was interesting how God had something so important. He wanted, wanted it to be heard, it needed to be heard, what, what Peter and the 11 were going to say. Mm -hmm. And so he, in the temple this time, because of Pentecost, there were millions you know, uh, in, in the Passover, numbers of three million people who would come. And so you can imagine what the court was like, you know, that crowded and all the commotion, all the distractions that were going on. Yeah. And so he, he points the people to this area where the apostles are with the, the roaring sound of the wind. Mm -hmm. And then once they're there, he points them to the actual apostles with the flames above their heads. So who do we listen to? It's, it's these 12 men. And then they begin to speak and... Yeah, I mean, yeah, this was this was meant to get the attention of the crowds, and the crowds were huge, hundreds of thousands, millions, even some count uh, for these for these feasts, and and that's why you know it could be too like the people that mocked them were just like passers by, you know, like they they weren't necessarily even in the original crowd, like they just kind of passed by and they hear like, well, here's twelve people speaking in all kinds of crazy languages, like these people must be must be drunk, uh, and you know, of course, Peter's gonna. Peter's going to address that in the next section. So yeah, really good. Let's, let's go ahead and read 14 through 21. But Peter, taking his stand uh, with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what uh, was spoken of through the prophet Joel, and it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth of my spirit on all mankind. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will grant wonders in the sky above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Um, Peter, probably at this point, and again, can't be 100% sure on the logistic, but I, I'm assuming at this point, he's now speaking to them in a more universal language, that, that now everybody can understand what he's saying, and he assures them the apostles are not drunk, but this is that. <laughs> this is that which was prophesied in in Joel chapter 2. God promised to pour out his spirit, and that's what's happening to the apostles. And uh, he promised that the outpouring of the spirit would be a time that was accompanied by, by miracles. And the tongue speaking that the apostles are doing is certainly miraculous. Uh, this language is very weird to us in verses 19 through 21, but it's important to understand that was a common way in the prophets to describe a cataclysmic change in the current world order. It's poetic language about how all the things that you are used to and think are normal are about to change completely. Things that you would think are normal, like, you know, the sun's in the sky and like you can go up in the sky at night and see see the moon up there no that's all fallen that's all going to be shaken you know that you think the earth is stable no the earth's going to be shaken everything uh, crazy is going is going to happen because god is just is basically intervening and stepping into history completely disrupting things in the world and usually the neat thing about this is usually this language is used to describe when god steps in to overthrow some earthly kingdom or power. So when he talks about destroying Babylon, he says in Isaiah 13, 10, the stars of heaven, their constellations will not flash forth their light. The sun will be dark when it rises and the moon 
will not shed its light. Even earlier, the judgment language in Joel 2, actually, earlier in the chapter, he says, before then, the, the earth quakes and the heavens tremble and the sun and moon grow dark and the stars lose their, their brightness. If, if you think about it, in Acts 2, God is stepping into history and he is changing the current world order. The things that you think are normal, like, hey, Caesar is king, you know, the Roman, the Romans, they're the ones in, in power. Actually, now God is inaugurating a kingdom far more powerful that will ultimately conquer and bring Rome down. Uh, we use language like this sometimes when we say God is doing something earth shattering. You know, when we say oh, that, that was an earth shattering event. Well, we're not like being literal. We're not saying like literally the earth was shattered. We're just saying it was huge. It was momentous. It was, it was cataclysmic. And that's what's happening here. And he also mentions the, the day of the Lord in verse 20. And that is a repeated theme in scripture. The day of the Lord is basically any time God comes in judgment on his enemies and saves the righteous. And usually it's kind of a simultaneous thing. <laughs> he steps in, he judges the, the wicked and then he also brings salvation to his people. Well, um, there are different versions of that throughout history. Uh, Acts 2 is one version of the day of the Lord because Jesus is introduced as king. And as soon as Jesus is made king, all those who reject him will be judged. But all those who accept him will be saved. The destruction of Jerusalem will be a day of the Lord in 70 A.D., and Jesus even uses this same poetic language to describe it in Matthew 24. Because God is going to judge and tear down kind of the, the perversion now of the man-made system of Judaism. But he's going to gather the righteous who abandon that system to himself. And of course, the final day of the Lord right, is the final day of judgment when he comes back and judges the wicked, but also ultimately saves the, the righteous. Jesus is disrupting the world order, establishing his kingdom. And anyone who wants to be saved from God's wrath must call upon his name. And I, I think there's some significance here because when you read Joel 2, 21 as a Jew, when it says those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved, you're thinking, oh, well, that's Yahweh. That's, you know, God, the, the Father. That's our Father in heaven. We call on his name to be saved. Peter's saying, actually, the name you need to be calling on to be saved is Jesus of Nazareth. He's going to say later in the sermon at the end, he's the one God has made the Lord. He's the Lord that you need to call on if you want to be saved. Really power. I mean, it just would have, would have been so shocking for the Jews to, to kind of consider that. Comments, questions about that, that section. <clears throat> All right. Um, you can still send in if, uh, comments or questions if you want, but it's, it's kind of cool to see just the logical flow of, of Peter's sermon. Uh, he starts by explaining why they're seeing these miracles, which would really you know, grab their attention and show the audience, like, like Dave said, that they should be taking the apostles very seriously because of what they're doing. And once he has enraptured their, their uh, attention, or capture their intention, he then goes on to explain how all of this is being made possible. And he does so by, in verse 22 and 23, talking about Jesus' death, 24 to 32, Jesus' resurrection, 33 to 35, Jesus' ascension and exaltation as king, and then the conclusion in verse 36, that you murdered the king who is now making all of this possible. Uh, it's important to see too, like the, the apostles inspired by the Holy Spirit, when they preached, it wasn't just a stream of consciousness. It was, very, it was actually, there was logic, there was order, there was flow to the sermons that the apostles give. And of course, we're always reminded of that at preacher training program. <laughs> like, you know, don't just get up there and just say stuff. Make sure there's a flow to it and people know where you're going and why you're saying what you're saying. That's what the apostles did. It's really an amazing, this sermon's so amazing. And I, sometimes probably we're just so familiar with this sermon. Maybe we kind of grow used to it and aren't as impressed by it. But I just want to encourage you to be impressed, be re-impressed, you know, with this sermon. So let, let's continue in verse 22 and 23. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, 
a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God also performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. This man, delivered over the, by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. So Peter, he introduces Jesus as a man here. That's kind of his first emphasis. Jesus of Nazareth, a, a man. But there are some very unique things about this man, this human being. He's a man who was able to do things other men could not do. He could perform miracles, wonders, and signs. And um, I was going to ask this, but just for time's sake, I'll, I'll move ahead. I don't uh, there are differences between miracle signs and wonders. The idea is a miracle is just an act of power. Uh, a sign is the idea that when you do an act of power, it's pointing to, to some other truth. And wonder is more talking about the reaction of the crowd to the, the power. Uh, it's, the, it's the reaction that's great. I don't think the point is, well, when Jesus raises the dead, that's a miracle and a sign, but it's not a wonder. Or when he walks on water, that's a wonder and a sign, but it's not a miracle. I, <laughs> that's not the point. He's just talking about miracles from different, different angles here. And the point is, Jesus of Nazareth was not just any human being. He was a man attested to by God, proven to be on God's side because God gave him these miraculous abilities. And the other amazing thing about this human is that God actually predetermined ahead of time that he would be killed by the Jews at the hands of godless Romans. And what happened to Jesus on the cross? It was just not a surprise to God. It was a part of his plan all along. And the point is not to ease their guilt. So they say, oh, well, you know, since God knew about it, and I guess we didn't have any choice but to do it. That, that's not the point. The point is, God knew even before the foundation of the world how wicked you would be. That you would be so evil, Peter is saying, and so godless that you would not even recognize that this man was from God. And instead, you would treat him like the worst of criminals, even nailing him to a cross. Um, Sometimes we, maybe we think Peter doesn't hit them with guilt until the very end of the sermon. <laughs> uh, I think that they would have already felt some extreme discomfort. I think they would have already been kind of shifting in there. I say in the pews, they're probably standing at this point, but just kind of awkwardly like, oh man, this is all right. That's, that's kind of hard to think about. And this is another point about sermons. Sermons are not meant to make us feel good. I think sometimes as a result, we, we can walk away feeling good depending on what, we, what we're talking about. But Jesus said this about the work of the Holy Spirit in John 16, 8. He, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and, and judgment. So the, the very first thing the Holy Spirit is doing through the apostles is convicting the world of their sin of rejecting God's Son. So the Holy Spirit, it is called a comforter, but, it's, but, he, but he is also going to tell it like it is. He's going to tell you the truth. It's going to hurt. And that's what, that's what Peter's doing. So let's look at the next section about his resurrection. Verse 24. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. For David says of him, I saw the Lord always in my presence, for he is at my right hand, so that I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue exalted. Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope, because you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow your Holy One to undergo decay. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Uh, so now Jesus has moved from just being a human being on God's side to also being a human who did what no other human had ever done before, and that is to conquer the grave, never to die again. It was impossible, it says, for him to be held in death's power. Um, while Jesus, uh, and interestingly it says, he, he put an end to the agony of death. He calls it literally the birth pains of death, which is really an odd, I mean, it almost sounds like an oxymoron. I mean, if a woman is having birth pains, it's not because she's about to die or introduce death into the world, it's because she's about to bring life into the world. So I think there are a couple ways to take this, uh, things going on here, this idea of birth pains of, of death. Uh, number one, 
Jesus, if you remember, he told the apostles, when I go away, you're going to be grieving. It's going to be painful for you. And he even said in John 16, it'll be like a woman who's in childbirth. And she goes through all this pain and agony and suffering. But then once the child comes into the world, she has so much joy. She doesn't even remember the, the agony that she went through. So there's some sense in which Jesus is, uh, this idea of birth pains of death is the idea that death is not permanent. But while Jesus is dead, while he was in the grave, it was an agonizing thing for the apostles. That was, that was really hard for them. But I think there's a, something else going on here. This is another really interesting way to think about this. Is that while Jesus was in the grave, the grave itself was like a pregnant woman in agony that could not take the pain anymore. And, and Jesus had to be released into life. Sometimes when a, and this isn't, this isn't wise to say to a woman, but sometimes if she's, if she's pregnant and she's just, you know, she's about to have a baby, we'll say, you know, she looks like she's about to pop. All right, we'll say that. And again, don't, don't go and say that to a woman, bad idea. But the point is the grave, while it was holding Jesus, it was about to pop on the third day. By the third day, it was just, that was, it couldn't take the pain of childbirth anymore. It, it had to release Jesus. It had to, to let him free from the grave. And the thing that's so crucial to keep in mind is that the, in the Jewish understanding, the Messiah would live forever. There's so much imagery in the prophets about this. Um, but what they missed, what they missed is that it was God's plan for the Messiah to die first and be raised before living forever. He didn't get that part. They got the part that he lived forever. They were absolutely right about that. Lots of, lots of Old Testament scriptures talk about that. But they missed this, this dying part first. So verse 24 that we just read, consistent with the concept that the Messiah would conquer the grave and live forever. But it is different than what the Jews expected. And another one of the passages in the scriptures that the Jews understood to be teaching that the Messiah would live forever is Psalm 16, the very one that Peter now, now addresses. And David wrote that psalm. And if you were to read that psalm in its original context, the idea is just, you know, King David, he's got a lot of enemies and they're, try, they're always trying to kill him. And David's just saying, look, God, you're going to... You're going to save me from death. You're, you're not going to let my enemies prevail here. You're not going to let my enemies kill me. Well, the Jews understood this to be a, a messianic passage. Number one, because it was written by David. And David was the ideal king of Israel. And the prophet said there's one like David coming. So many of the things that David wrote were attributed by Jews to the messianic king. Uh, they also attributed this to the Messiah because they thought, well, this is consistent with all the other verses that say he's going to live forever. <laughs> he's not, his soul's not going to be in Hades. Hades is the grave, the realm of the dead. So yeah, Jesus, he's not going to go to Hades. He's not the, or the Messiah. He's not going to go to the realm of the dead at all. He's the Messiah will never go to the grave. That's what the Jews thought David was saying here, but they were misunderstanding Psalm 16 because David, David is not saying He's not saying God would never let the Messiah die. He's saying God would not abandon him in the grave and leave his body there to decay. Now, a question. If David in Psalm 16 is saying, God will not leave me in the grave to decay, what's the problem? <laughs> He's been dead for a thousand years by the time Acts 2 is written. I'd say his body is pretty decayed. He's been in a grave for a very long time. So David could not have been talking about himself. And this is Peter's point. Continue. Verse 29 down through uh, 32. Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. And so because he was a prophet and knew that God had sworn to him with an oath to seat one of his descendants on his throne, he looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. 
This could not be primarily about David because he was left in the grave to decay. Ultimately, David as a prophet, he knew God's promise to seat one of his descendants on the throne forever. And he spoke this about him. Jesus was not abandoned by God in the grave. He was raised on the third day, which consequently in, uh, in Jewish thinking, the fourth day was the day when decay would start to set into your body. So literally in the Jewish worldview and thinking, Jesus was not allowed to undergo decay. God raised him from the grave before his body decayed of perfect fulfillment of Psalm 16. Peter, he's trying to reorient their thinking that yes, the Messiah would live forever, but first it was God's predetermined plan that he would die. And now that he's been resurrected, he'll live and reign forever. He is the king they have been waiting for. He gathers and restores God's scattered people. And this last section, uh, very quickly, Jesus's ascension and exaltation. Therefore, verse 33, having been exalted to the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Again, the Jews all knew, Joel too, they all knew God the Father was going to pour out the Holy Spirit. But Peter is saying something so shocking to them that they did not understand, and that is that it was Jesus who was pouring out the Holy Spirit. He is the one who is responsible for all of this miraculous activity by the Spirit that you are seeing because He is the one who fulfills Psalm 110, seated at the right hand of God, reigning from heaven. And that all leads to his grand conclusion in verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. So here's a man. He's attested to God by miracles. He conquered death and lives forever as the king the Jews were waiting for for centuries. The man who ascended into heaven and is now reigning as king, Peter says, you crucified him. You crucified God's anointed one. I think about David. He had the perfect opportunity to kill Saul and Saul was a horrible man. And yet he said, shall I stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed? Shall I kill God's anointed? Far, far be it from me. And yet the Jews murdered Jesus, somebody who was not like Saul at all. He was perfectly sinless. And yet they and yet they killed him. Can you imagine the sweat coming off their, their foreheads now at the, end, at the end of this sermon? And all the awkward gulps and, and gasps and heads down in shame and tears rolling down their faces. And right now, this sounds like horrible news. And they know they are in huge trouble. But stay tuned for next class because we'll see that God uses the worst sin ever committed and turns it into the greatest blessing the world will ever hear and know. King Jesus gathers and restores God's scattered people. And I'll just say this last thing and still leave you with a minute to comment. I think this is a particularly comforting message because, because of the virus, it just feels like we're scattered right now. It just doesn't feel the same. And yet Jesus has the power to keep us united, to keep us together spiritually. And I know that we're all feeling it. It's just so weird. I'm sick of it. You're sick of it. We hate it. Okay? I get it. But Jesus is still king. We are still his people. He will. He will keep us unified. He will gather his scattered people again. Hope that's comforting to you. And you have a minute left for any comments or questions. I want to make sure I didn't run out of time again this time. Dave? Just think about how greatly the Messiah was anticipated by the Jews. And you know, that's part of the reason why I think that the triumphal entry was the way that it was. Because it was so, expectations were so high in it during the Passover. And then to come to realize not only did you miss the Messiah, but you put him to death as well. Yeah. It's one thing to just miss him. Like, oh, you mean the Messiah came? And like, oh, I, I, we didn't even see him. Like, that's one thing. But for him to come and for you to murder him, mm. it's, it's really sad. And, and honestly, it's so easy to look down 
my nose at them. So, ah, you know, how could they do that? If we were there and we had the same understanding they did, we, we would have done the same thing. We would have been, we would have been shouting crucify him. Um, likely. It could be we were one of the disciples. Not everybody was shouting crucify. You know, but it, it's probable because the majority of the people rejected him. Well, I hope that was encouraging. Thank you so much for your comments and participation. Um, read through pages 24A for Wednesday night's class.